So today, we're looking at the nervous system. This is going to be a nice sort of transition from transport. And the molecules we're largely going to be working with here are the ones we introduced yesterday, sodium and potassium. So, of all my students here, where do we find sodium in the highest concentration relative to the plasma membrane? Outside the cell. And what is our sort of principle that we learned about the relationship between sodium and potassium? Opposites. So if sodium is highest outside, potassium is going to be highest inside. Now that's going to be critical as we get toward the end of our time and we're talking about nerves and the transmission of nerve impulses. We're going to be using sodium and potassium. We're going to be using gated channels and certainly we're going to be pumping sodium and potassium. What pump do you think we're going to use for that? Sodium potassium pump. Remember 12% of our total body's expenditure of energy. So we're going to use a lot of those in neurons and we're going to be using diffusion too. So almost everything we learned about transport, we're going to be using as it relates to the nervous system. So just a little bit of review kind of anatomy, we're not getting into a lot. But when we look at neurons, we can basically subdivide them in a number of different ways. We can subdivide them based on how they look, and we're saving that for anatomy class. But here we're gonna subdivide them based on the direction with which they transmit their information. So we divide them into sensory neurons and motor neurons. The name sort of tells you what's going on. With sensory neurons, information about the environment and information about the condition of your body is going to the central nervous system to provide and integrate that information so you can decide what to do next. Since the information is going from the periphery to the center, and in many ways going to your brain, the, the peak of the central nervous system, we say that sensory neurons transmit ascending information, or another way it's referred to as afferent information. The A, I like to think of it means arriving. So relative to the brain and the central nervous system, sensory information is arriving so that it can be integrated and you can decide what is the action I then need to take. Now when you think of motor, I think of accomplishing work. So motor neurons are going to instruct the body how to accomplish work. And so in this way, motor neurons are taking that information from the central nervous system and distributing it downward. So we sometimes say this is descending information or efferent, e meaning exit. So this transmission of signals is either going up or down afferent or efferent, sensory or motor. But regardless, the molecular technique with how these signals are transmitted are going to be identical. It's simply changing of the gradients of sodium and potassium. That's it. So again, you can see they look a little different in shape. Some have this big eyeball sitting on their stalk that's going to be typical for our sensory Neurons, our motor neurons are going to have this really spiny looking head within the central nervous system and a very long process that leads away from the central nervous system. We'll talk about these a little bit more as we get to the next slide. Here we go. So the processes that radiate out almost like a star away from the neuron or the nerve cell, we call these processes neurites collectively together. And we have two types, the dendrites and the axons. Now the dendrites are typically going to be sprouting off of the cell body or the soma. And these are gonna look kinda of like a starfish. So they look a little bit different. They're gonna be thinner in nature and more numerous than our one larger singular axon. Now, not only do they look different, but the direction with which 
information travels is also going to be different. Dendrites are essentially going to transmit information to the cell body. So you can almost think of them like sensory fibers. Afferent information coming to the cell body. The cell body is going to be our analog to the brain. And once all this information in the form of concentration gradients and membrane potentials that we sort of touched on last time, once that gets added up in the cell body, that could then potentially lead to the information and that electrical impulse being sent down the axon and the axon transmits this electrical chemical information away from the cell body. All right. So very similar to what we see with sensory and motor neurons, the cell types, here we see it on a molecular level at the cell body. So here's our cell body in this illustration. We can see a number of these small processes extending from the cell body. Those are the dendrites. And then we have the one, and even though it doesn't look a lot thicker, this is, this is going to be thicker and much longer, this process, and that's going to be our one axon. Information comes into the cell body through the dendrites, leaves the cell body going to the next cell through the axon. All right. Again, this is just a simple review of neuronal cell biology so we can understand how the signal gets transmitted. It can go in different directions, but now we're going to see how does this wave go from one place to the next. So when we look at the electrical activity within a nerve cell, we are first going to start with the separation of our ions across the plasma membrane. And we talked about that last time, the fixed anions, sodium, potassium, potassium being the most permeable. And when the cell is doing nothing, there is a voltage, a charge difference across that membrane. And so what is that membrane potential of a cell? What is that called when the cell's doing nothing? Do you remember that term we applied? Resting membrane potential, RMP. And do you remember the number that I said specifically we are going to remember for neurons, you know, there was a range of them, but what was the number we were going to remember for our resting membrane potential. Negative 70 millivolts. Write that down, circle it, highlight it, put flashing lights beside it. You gotta have that number. We gotta have that number because that's gonna be our baseline. From minus 70, everything else is going to take place. Now, looking at this transmission of signal and changing our electrochemical gradients, changing our membrane potentials, this is fairly complicated. So we're gonna start extremely simple and then we're gonna get more complex and we're gonna change some things, all right? So the first thing I want you to understand is from minus 70 millivolts, we can do, well, we can really do three things. One, we cannot change at all and we just stay at minus 70, so we stay at resting membrane potential. But if we, through whatever stimulus we have, causes those ions to change position, and in doing so, it causes the inside of the cell to become more negative than minus 70. So if you were looking at a graph, and here's minus 70, and all of a sudden a resting membrane potential were to go more negative, that is called hyperpolarization. And again, yesterday we said hyper meant what? as a prefix, too much, uh, above. In this case, hyperpolarization means we're even more polarized. Because when you have a charge difference, minus 70, inside's more negative than the outside. So we are polarized. And that cell is gonna be polarized until our membrane potential gets to what number? At what membrane potential is the cell no longer polarized, meaning there's no charge difference. Zero. Zero. 
Zero. At a resting membrane potential of zero, the charges are the same on both sides of the membrane. So if you get more negative, hyperpolarized, even more polarized, but if we get more positive than minus 70 millivolts, now we're moving towards zero, right? We're eliminating the polarization. So we refer to that movement as depolarization. Now, these terms again are very simple and we're gonna modify them and change up their definition as we move down the road. But for right now, minus 70, resting membrane potential, minus 90, what would we call that? Hyper, minus 40, I mean minus 40, D, okay? Again, just starting simple and building from there. So that's the changes that we're talking about at this point. <coughs> We're, we're going to see that these are all components of this electrical wave we're going to generate. We'll put all the, the pieces in action here in a few minutes. Right now, we're just assembling the building blocks before we put this all together. So if we were to depolarize our membrane to negative 40, or let's say we depolarized it to positive 30. Now, even though we're positive, we're more positive than minus 70. Okay, we're starting to polarize again on the, po the plus side, but we're still calling it depolarization because it's all relative to minus 70. So let's say we're at positive 30. Now the cell wants to return to resting membrane potential. And it's gonna use our, our old friend, sodium potassium pump, to make that happen, to reestablish those gradients. Now, where does the sodium potassium pump move sodium ions? It moves them from the inside to the outside. That's why sodium is highest outside. How many molecules does it move? Three. Now back to our active transport, the movement of three sodium ions out of the cell with the direct utilization of ATP, how can we very specifically refer to that? primary active transport. Now once it does so, does it immediately just reset itself with nothing else going on? No, it has to pick up an extra passenger before it can return to its starting position. And what does it have to pick up? Two potassium to then reset itself and transport them inside. What kind of active transport is that? Isn't that cool? Two potassium, secondary. See how you can link that together? So whenever uh, it picks up the two potassium ions, does that kind of kick off uh, the ADP? And then you have to wait for ATP to kind of like, uh, ATP reopens it and allows uh, the potassium to go in and then it picks up the sodium? The, the specific molecular triggers for that movement, I'm not... I don't know if the ADP comes off and then the binding of the potassium resets it or the binding of the potassium. I'm not it's sure the sequence of those, it's one or the others. Or once you reset, a new ATP comes and kicks off the ADP. I, I'm not sure. We'll get into a little bit more specifics like that when we get to muscle contraction because we're going to be playing with ATP and ADP. But at that level, I, I don't know what those last few sequences are relative to the ADP and the ATP that resets it. All right. So, positive 30, sodium potassium pump kicks into high gear. Now we start to make our membrane potential more negative. And as we now move back toward minus 70, we are trying to re-establish the polarized state, reset to resting membrane potential. So we refer to that movement as a re-polarization, okay? We're still more positive than minus 70. And as that sodium potassium pump continues to lower that membrane potential, we are repolarizing. Now, if in that process, the sodium potassium pump pushes out too much and we end up going minus 68, minus 69, minus 70, 
Minus 71. Minus 7. What are we doing now? Hyper. As soon as we get past minus 70, now we've hyperpolarized. But until that point, even though we're going down, it's still repolarization. Okay? Do you, you see the difference? Okay. We have established our very, very steep electrochemical gradients. I think it was potassium. It was like 150 versus 5. So it's, again, it's almost jumping out of an airplane. That's how steep our gradients are. And we need these steep gradients because how do we need diffusion to take place? Steep gradients are going to mean what? Relative to the rate of diffusion. Faster. Faster. So we've established these very steep gradients, but now we have to set in place means with which we can control the diffusion of sodium and potassium along their concentration gradients at the right time. And the way we're going to do this is using protein channels that are triggered at certain membrane potentials that when the membrane potential reaches a certain threshold these channels will activate and they will open like the floodgates on our hydroelectric dam and since they're regulated by voltage we call them voltage gated channels and so the first voltage gated channel that we really have to pay attention to here is going to be the sodium voltage gated channel. In, in our transmission of an electrical impulse, this is the first one we use. This is going to be the trigger that starts the whole process. And once you open these, the signal is going to go to the end and it's not going to stop. And the way we make sure of that is our sodium voltage gated channel is going to open at a membrane potential of negative 55 millivolts. There's another number you're going to circle, you're going to highlight, you're going to underline, you're going to put screaming red flashing lights by negative 55 millivolts. This is the threshold for the opening of the sodium voltage gated channels. <coughs> Now, some other channels we have are, are referred to as leakage channels. Um, these are almost like old rusty pipes that water is just going to leak out of. But unfortunately, this, the cell doesn't replace them. They're there for a reason. And these leaky channels are leaky for potassium. You remember yesterday we said potassium was the most permeable ion? It had the greatest effect on membrane potential. It's because these channels are leaky. And as potassium leaks, if, it, if too much of it leaks, the sodium potassium pump's gonna go, ah, potassium, get back in here. And it's gonna pump it back in. That whole hemodynamics and homeostasis of balancing out ions is gonna be critical for what's happening inside of the cell. So I want you to understand that in this illustration, we are showing the states within which our channels can exist. And this is our voltage gated sodium channel. So at resting membrane potential, at what number are we talking about? Negative 70 millivolts. I'm going to make you repeat this so many times you're going to be sick of anything that says 70 or minus 70. So at negative 70 millivolts, our receptor, our channel, our sodium voltage gated channel is closed. No sodium can pass. See, we've got two sodium outside, none inside. So they got the concentration right for that illustration. But when our membrane potential gets to minus 56 millivolts, what happens? Be careful, that's a trick question. When our membrane potential gets to minus 56 millivolts, what happens? What? Nothing. Why? You got to get to 55. 
56, it's still closed. You're not going to send a signal. If you have a stimulus that depolarizes, and again, we're just going to use that term for now, and I almost hate saying it, but we're going to get more positive if we go from minus 70 to minus 60. Nothing. Eventually, the sodium potassium pump will repolarize us back to minus 70. You have to reach minus 55. And at minus 55 or more positive, that channel is going to open. It says activated here. I like open. So you're closed at rest. You're open when you at rest reach a potential of minus 55 or more positive. But here's the other state that I want you to understand about this voltage gated channel. You see this little bobber thingy down here? It's called a gate. I like to think of it as a stopper. You know the stopper you put in the bathtub? Okay. So in this case, our sodium voltage gated channel opens up. Where is sodium going to go? It's going to flood inside the cell. Remember, we've got this huge, steep gradient. As soon as it opens, whoosh, it's like opening a trap door. All the sodium just floods into the cell. And this gradient is so great that this receptor can't open and reset fast enough to prevent too much sodium. And in fact, this built-in mechanism within which our little stopper inactivates the receptor still isn't quite fast enough to keep it from getting more positive than it needs to. But it's better than how long it would take to reset the whole receptor. So our receptor can be closed. Our receptor can be opened. But our receptor can be opened and inactivated. Is any sodium going to diffuse here? Is sodium going to diffuse here? Yes. Is sodium going to diffuse here? No. So in the closed or inactivated state, sodium cannot diffuse. Open and closed, we've got a pretty good grasp on those, but this inactivated state, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that it can also exist in a state in which sodium can't diffuse. So it's like our sodium voltage gated channel, when it senses negative 55 millivolts, it opens, but almost as soon as it opens, this little stopper goes and plugs it up. That then gives the receptor enough time to reset itself, remove the stopper so it can do it again. And in that way, it doesn't let too, way too much sodium diffuse. Does that make sense? And we're going to see that is absolutely critical in our transmission of impulses. <coughs> and specifically, our transmission of multiple impulses. So far, we have looked at resting potential, hyperpolarization, depolarization, and repolarization. These different steps, and the different ways in which we can alter our membrane potentials. Now we're going to put this together in what we refer to as an action potential. I'm going to compare the action potential to a wave. And the wave I like to think about is not the wave at the beach. Because if I start thinking about the beach, that's where I'm going to want to be. Have you ever been in a big coliseum somewhere and the fans start doing the wave? And it goes all the way around the stadium over and over and over until everybody gets tired? That is very analogous to how an action potential is going to work. Each individual in the stadium is going to represent a voltage-gated channel. The standing up and the sitting down is going to represent the opening and closing of these voltage-gated channels in sequence that's going to allow for this depolarization and repolarization event to occur. And so that electrochemical wave is going to wash down our axon. Okay? So we're, we're going to put it into motion. So, 
when we look at how we achieve an action potential, we are going to start at rest and change that number on your slides from 77 to 70. I, again, different cells and different books will give you different numbers. I like zeros and fives. It's just easier for me to keep up with those. So resting potential for us is always going to be negative 70. Now, right now, we are referring to these changes in the electrical potential as a stimulus. You might could even put quotation marks around it. We're going to define what the stimulus is in just a little bit. But right now, just a stimulus that leads to the change in our membrane potential to get us to minus 55 millivolts. Now, what is minus 55 millivolts? What, what happens there? For... It's the threshold for opening the sodium voltage gated channels. I'm going to give you another piece of information. Negative 55 millivolts is also the threshold to initiate an action potential. If you do not reach negative 55 or more positive, you will not propagate an action potential. We call it the all or nothing rule. If you get to that minus 56, like I tried to trick you a little while ago, sodium voltage gated channel stays closed, the sodium potassium pump kicks into a little higher gear, and we repolarize the resting potential. Nothing happens. <coughs> but if you hit negative 55, you get an action potential, and you can't stop it until it completes its cycle. So since negative 55 millivolts is the threshold to open sodium voltage gated channels and negative 55 millivolts is the threshold with which to propagate an action potential, what can you then deduce about the relationship between a sodium voltage gated channel and an action potential? Opening the sodium voltage gated channel is how you start an action potential. If you do not have sodium voltage gated channels in your membrane, you cannot propagate action potentials. That's going to be important information when we start to look at these stimuli and other differences between axons and dendrites. So when we get minus 55 or more positive, we open our sodium voltage gated channels and sodium is transported from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. This is kind of a trick question. What transport mechanism is used to move sodium from the, inside, from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell? What transport mechanism? Think very carefully. Put all of our information together. Sodium is transported through the sodium voltage gated channel, which is a protein. So what is our transport mechanism? Facilitated, facilitated what's the second word? Diffusion. diffusion. It's facilitated diffusion. How much energy did we use? None directly. We use the energy to create the gradient with our sodium potassium pump, but we did not use any energy to initiate our action potential. We just open our sodium voltage gated channel at negative 55. Now sodium rushes into the cell. What charge does sodium have? Positive charge. The inside of the cell is more negative. When all of these positive charges start flooding to the inside of the cell, it's making the inside of the cell more positive now. So our membrane potential is less polarized. So our number from minus 55 is going to get more positive. What did we call that sort of change? Depolarization. Depolarization. And in fact, we cannot inactivate that sodium voltage gated channel fast enough such that we don't achieve a positive 30 millivolts. That's how high this depolarization gets. 
And again, I know at positive 30 we're polarized again, but don't let that hang anybody up. We're just more positive than minus 70. Let's just stick with that right now. So depolarization of our membrane occurs because we initiated an action potential at minus 55 millivolts. We opened the sodium voltage gated channels. Sodium rushed into the cell. That caused depolarization of the membrane. Now, somewhere in the neighborhood of a positive membrane potential, and I don't have the exact number, but as you get into that positive neighborhood, now we've got a second set of voltage-gated channels, and these are specific for potassium. So potassium voltage-gated channels are going to open at about the time that the sodium voltage-gated channels inactivate. Well, when you open potassium voltage-gated channels, where does potassium go? It goes out. What transport mechanism? Facilitated diffusion. What charge does potassium have? Now these positives start to leave, which makes the inside more negative. Now our potential starts to go back down towards 70. Negative 70, what do we call that? Repolarization. But again, our potassium channels open, they inactivate, but they can't do it fast enough so that you stop right at negative 70. And in fact, we see our membrane potential that will actually get more negative than minus 70 for a little piece. Hyperpolarization. So when we put all this together, we reach negative 55, we depolarize, we go up. Potassium channels open, we repolarize. We inactivate and close them, but we still get a little more negative, hyperpolarize. And it's in this hyperpolarized period that our sodium potassium pumps go how we have to reestablish resting membrane potential. But now, what, what is the other thing that we have to reestablish? Not just the charge, but what? What did we let too much come in and too much go out? Our sodium and potassium, our concentration gradients are jacked up. We've got to reestablish that steep gradient so we can do the signal again. So that's where our sodium potassium pump kicks into high gear to reestablish our very steep concentration gradients on either side of our plasma membrane. So if you could take a snapshot or, or a time lapse, in other words, of an action potential, what we're going to see is here's our resting membrane potential at minus 70. That little blip that we see, that's what we call our stimulus, okay? It's more positive than minus 70, but we're rapidly going to not call that a depolarization. Because when do we depolarize? When do we, in fact, start depolarization? At what number? Negative 55. That's where we start depolarization because that's the first part of our action potential. So I like reserving depolarization for our action potential. So we're going to call this little blip between minus 70 and minus 55, we're going to call it a stimulus for now. And when we change that voltage to minus 55, what channels open at minus 55? Sodium voltage gated channels. You ever get in trouble and your parents use all your names? Okay. Well, this, this receptor is always going to be in trouble, so we're going to use all the names. Sodium voltage gated channel. It opens up. When it opens up, sodium floods in. It changes our potential more positive. So what do we call this upward spike in our potential? Depolarization. So this is depolarization caused by the influx of sodium. As we're getting more positive, potassium channels are going to open. That allows potassium to flood out, making the inside more negative. That's what accounts for this slope coming back down. 
And when we're coming back toward resting potential, trying to reset resting membrane potential, we call that what? Repolarization. But you see how we overshoot just a little bit and get under minus 70? What's that? After hyperpolarization. And then our sodium potassium pumps reset the voltage potentials as well as our concentration gradients to get us back to resting membrane potential. Now, this happens all together in milliseconds. Milliseconds. Because your body has to be prepared to do this over and over and over and over and over. Every time you blink, there's at least one action potential that's signaling your muscles of your eyelids to move. So when you think about how fast can you blink? I'd say snap fingers, but I can blink fast. You see what I'm saying? You have to reset this so you can do it again and again and again. So here's another couple of ways to look at it. I like to provide you different examples, presented the information in different ways in the hopes that something's gonna stick, all right? We talked about sodium potassium pumps eating up 12% of your body's energy utilization every day. Well, this is one reason. One neuron, one nerve cell may have one million sodium potassium pumps in its membrane. I mean, think of the mil millions of cells and the millions of neurons you have in your own body. I mean, it's astronomical. And these pumps can move 200 ions per second. Per second. That's fast. That's fast. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you that, yeah, I, I, I can't fathom how fast that works. But the, the process occurs in milliseconds so that we can reset to do this all over again. Okay, that was a snapshot of what's going on in one local place in our nerve cell. Now we're going to make the wave at the football game. Because when you have all these sodium voltage-gated channels and potassium voltage-gated channels all lined up like dominoes, you ever stack dominoes and then knock them over and watch each one knock each other down? That's kind of what we're going to do with our action potential. Because if we start, and I usually like a classroom with a bunch of students so I can have everybody help out. But when we start, we start with a sodium voltage gated channel. All right. So we're at resting membrane potential, minus 70 millivolts. When we reach minus 56 millivolts, what is this sodium voltage gated channel going to do? Good, you're catching on to my tricks. But at minus 55 millivolts, this sodium voltage gated channel is going to do what? Open. Sodium is going to go where? Inside. Inside. See this, okay, I'm glad, no, no, I'm glad you did that. You said outside because we're so grained now, highest concentration outside, highest concentration outside. When you open the channel, it's going to flow downhill. It's going to jump out of the airplane. So sodium is going to flood into the cell. Now think back to our cell biology and think about the cytoskeleton of the cell. Beneath the plasma membrane, we have a lot of actin, intermediate filament, I mean microfilaments. They're going to help form the shape of that cell. So when the sodium comes in, it's not like falling through empty space. There's a lot of stuff inside of the cell. So when that sodium comes pouring in, it's going to hit these cytoskeletal elements and these proteins, and it's going to flatten out. And when that sodium comes into the cell, where is it going to go? If I were to take this water bottle and open it up and pour it on this desk, where is it going to go? Ah, say it. Everywhere. The path of least resistance. So when sodium comes into that cell, it's going to go everywhere beneath the plasma membrane, flowing with those microfilaments. They call them cable properties. 
And so when that sodium comes in, spreads in all directions, all these positive molecules, it's not just affecting the local membrane potential here. It's affecting the membrane potential possibly up to two, one to two millimeters away. And guess what we're going to have within that one to two millimeters from our sodium voltage gated channel? Another sodium voltage gated channel. Okay? And then within one to two millimeters of that one, there's going to be another sodium voltage gated channel. You see what we're, we're doing here? We're setting the stage for. So we've got our sodium voltage gated channel. It opens. Sodium comes flooding in. What's going to happen to our membrane potential when sodium comes flooding in? What term do we use? D, it's going to depolarize. Now, right here beside our sodium voltage gated channel, we got a potassium voltage gated channel. It's going to open because we depolarized. It's going to allow potassium to come in, I mean, that's in, go out. What's going to happen to our membrane potential there? Repolarize. But that sodium that came in, it's going to spread all the way over here, and we have another sodium voltage gated channel. The sodium that came in is going to be enough so that the membrane at this location reaches negative 55 or more positive. And what's going to happen to this sodium voltage gated channel? It's going to depolarize. It's going to open. Sodium floods in and goes where? Everywhere. Within, we got another sodium voltage gated channel that opens because you see the domino effect. And by having all of those voltage gated channels aligned, we're going to conduct or regenerate the action potential, the entire length of our axon. So, when we depolarize here, approximately what voltage are we going to get up to? Remember that number we looked at? That, that number's not critical. 30. Yeah, positive 30. This opened because of a stimulus. But let's say our axon extended all the way over here. We've got some axons that go all the way down to your big toe. All right, from your spinal cord to your big toe. That's a long way. When you throw a pebble into a pond, where are the biggest waves? The biggest, highest waves are right in the center. What happens to the waves as they spread out? Small, it loses energy. But guess what? The depolarization that started it, the intensity was positive 30 millivolts. The very last sodium voltage gated channel that opens, guess what it's going to get up to? Positive 30. So you have conduction without any decrement. You don't lose the strength or intensity of the signal from beginning to end. Because you're not transmitting the energy from the very beginning, you're regenerating the signal all along the way. And so the signal is just as strong at the end as it was at the beginning. And that's our wave that's going to travel along the length of our axon. And if we do not modify that axon in any way, shape, or form, the transmission rate is about a meter per second. Meter per second is not that big a deal. Meter per second is nothing to write home about. I, I can run a meter per second, so it's pretty slow. All right? Now, when we look at our action potentials, because of the sodium-potassium pump, because of the opening, closing, inactivating of the gates, it's going to take upwards of 100,000 repeating action potentials, just over and over and over and over and over, to deplete the gradient such that you couldn't do it again. I, I don't know if we're ever humanly going to achieve that, naturally speaking. We simply can't will ourselves to do something that fast to deplete our action potentials. So we're always going to be able to do things fairly quickly and never exceed what we put together. So this is showing in a static illustration our action potential beginning at the left 
Here, sodium comes flooding in. What do we call that? Depolarization. Notice I'm making you say this over and over and over. We get depolarization here. The sodium goes in all directions. It's going to influence the neighboring sodium voltage gated channels and it depolarizes. That influences its neighbor to depolarize. And look what's trailing along behind it. Potassium leaving, which what do we call that? Repolarization. So this is the wave that's happening. Depolarization, repolarization, hyper resetting with our sodium potassium pump and doing it again. Now this is pretty fast, but it's not as fast as what your cells do. But do you see what's going on? There's our sodium potassium pump. There's a sodium channel. Others over here are potassium channels. And you see how the wave moves down the line. That's our action potential. Now, there are some instances where clinically we want to prevent action potentials. If I'm going to have a filling in my tooth and the dentist has a drill, I do want him to block some action potentials, right? From my pain receptors. How can we block action potentials? Anesthetics, local anesthetics. These are going to be some of our, our opiates. So the cocaines, procaine, xylocaine, novocaine. The way that many of these local anesthetics work is they decrease or prevent sodium permeability. If you block a sodium voltage gated channel, are you ever going to get a depolarization? No because sodium can never depolarize, you will never start to process, you get no signal. So our pain receptors, sensory receptors, pressure receptors in our mouth, gone, it just goes numb. So that's our local anesthetics. So here we see our sodium voltage gated channels blocking those with local anesthetics. There's other things that we're gonna talk about that we can use, there's some of the opioids uh, as we get into more in-depth about some specific kinds of receptors, ways that we can modify, manipulate, and block these other receptors. And that slide doesn't belong there. Now, when we looked at our action potential, especially the animation, sodium comes in and it goes everywhere, right? but it's only illustrated, and I only illustrated it affecting the sodium voltage gated channel here. So when the sodium comes in, it affects this sodium voltage gated channel. Sodium goes everywhere. Why doesn't it go back this way to affect you? Exactly. That has to do with the inactivated state of a sodium voltage gated channel. And we refer to those as refractory periods. And so in the case of our sodium voltage gated channel being inactivated, until it gets reset, we refer to it as the absolute refractory period. That sodium voltage gated channel cannot undergo another action potential no matter what. It's not going to happen. And so that refractory period ensures a single direction for the transmission and conduction of our action potential. It's never going to go backwards. So that's another big advantage of having that inactivated state of the receptor as well as the closed state. Now, there's, there's a second period in which you may could get another action potential if the membrane potential changed by a great enough extent. And so this is called the relative refractory period. 
you're not likely to repropagate an action potential, but you could. It's not absolutely no. This is a maybe. Have you ever asked your parents for money? Hey, Dad, can I have $1,000? Absolutely not. Are you going to get that money? No. Hey, Dad, can I have 10 bucks? Maybe. Now, my kids would say that still means no, but maybe it's not a definite no. All right? So that's how I like to look at these refractory periods. And the relative refractory period has to do with your, your potassium channels and how they were open enough to get you to a hyperpolarized state. Now, when, when I say hyperpolarized, what does that mean relative to our membrane potential? More negative than minus 70. So if you're at resting membrane potential, how far do you have to change the potential to propagate an action potential? How many units? We're doing math in our head, huh? 15. You've only got to have 15 positive units. But in our hyperpolarized state, let's say we hyperpolarize to minus 90. Is a 15 unit stimulus going to get you to minus 55? No. But if you could have a minus 35, a positive 35 or a positive 40 that hit that cell, yeah. It, it's going to get you up to 55, and that's all you have to do. So do you see how it's relative? You, you've got to have a bigger stimulus, but if you get a bigger stimulus and you hit minus 55 and your sodium voltage-gated channels are reset, yeah, you can do it again that fast. So it can happen. It's just not very likely. So here we see our absolute refractory period goes to the point of returning to resting potential then our relative refractory periods here in our hyperpolarized state, we could get to 55, but it's going to take a bigger stimulus to get us up there.